Call the meeting to order at 1.10 p.m. Uh, approval of minutes from the minutes, right? So we'll skip over the approval of minutes to, uh, to next, week, uh, next meeting. Uh, street sign request. Is there any street sign? I forgot to fill one out. Uh, full way stop at River and Jim. Huh? Yeah. What, what, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm working on some of this. Too. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think traffic had, counts, crash counts. Yeah. The yeah, crash counts are definitely up over the last few months. They're moving around shape. Uh, and actually going back quite a few years. Yeah. But, but, but the last, last few months has been pretty ridiculous. And they've broken down the annual crash into the new Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll discuss that at the next meeting. That's why that radar trailer is down there right now. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people blame it's speed, but I think it's more more distracted driving than yeah. speed. It's actually both because I sat down the street and I watched that thing blink. So yeah. the majority of it is speed. Yeah. Um, we'll find out when the numbers come in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, traffic infrastructure updates. Uh, the bridge possibly sprung at 25. South Street Bridge? Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, five. Five. Wow. Yeah. So it was being held up on the hydraulic department of uh, Mass DOT. They finally got to it, marked it up with comments. It's going back to the engineers. Uh, they have to address the comments, resubmit it to them. They have 30 days to act on it. And then if everything goes okay, um, they'll approve it and we'll be able to submit for the construction phase of the grant and uh, move forward. Um, Given the time frame to get the bidding out and everything, they still project in the spring of 25. So start dating, anyway, not completion. Yeah. Yeah. All right, before we get to uh, complete streets, um, I got an email from Peter Hoffman. They, they're looking at putting uh, charging stations on Woodward Ave. That's what these papers are. All right, yeah. Yeah, we just want to make sure it's not going to interfere with what we have planned. Uh, no, it's actually, well, right now it's designed to be on the property on the, uh, the church side. Church side, yeah. Our stuff is designed to be on the opposite side. Yeah, the opposite side. But I just didn't know if we were still going to be able to have those parking spots even coming out six feet, if we we're going to have the footage to. We won't know until the engineer comes in. Yeah. Okay. There's actually a, there's a meeting being held for the complete streets. One of the public meetings. Um, it's going to be at the 1870 Town Hall. We'll just put it in the calendar. Um, it might be a second before I find it. Uh, it is October 9th at 6 o'clock at the uh, 1870 telephone. They're going to come in, they're uh, going to do their presentation. Um, I think they have just a preliminary design. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people can put their comments in. Okay. All right. Then we'll jump to uh, this is parking sign for the dry hydrant south of the moment. Oh, that's one. Um, there's no parking sign right now in front of that dry hydrant for water. So the last time we had the uh, brush fire and stuff, we had a couple cars that were parked there. So I don't know if there's a way we can put a sign there that just says no parking or fire hydrant. Well, does it still have the sign that says back on the water? Hydrant? My understanding was no, but I think that I'll take a look at it. That came from. It might have been Joe Flanagan because they were down there getting water there. Let me look into it. All right. All right. Now we'll go back to why we're all here. All the good stuff. Yes. Yeah. So, Rob, Kevin, Jeff, they've been with, well, Jeff's the new man. <laughs> <laughs> the rest have been there forever. <laughs> but, um, Jeff's position is new. The, the, the commission's brought on what we're calling a, are we your senior engineer, is that? Well, technically under, <coughs> due to federal highway requirements, I am a senior transportation engine, oh, and planner engineer. Yeah, and planner. It has to have planning in there. Yeah. Because they won't fund an engineering position, but they'll fund a planner. And I think what the commission realized was that so often communities 
would move forward, like on complete streets or you know a tip project or whatever. But we could the small towns like us didn't always have the capacity to put together the final pieces, so you could get in line for a tip project or submit something to the state for you know like a bridge grant or something like that. And so the commission made the decision to to bring on this position that that Jeff has filled. Um, to sort of complement the other things that are going on in transportation. And it seemed like with the 62 corridor study that we did, which, you know, identified culvert issues and, and uh, the five corners and also the interchange, intersection between Gates Pond and 62, that there was a potential TIP project there, particularly maybe at the five corners. And we've never done a TIP project. So I think that enhances our likelihood of being successful if the project has merit. Um, and so, since it's new ground for us, it seemed like it made sense to have these guys come in and chat with us, particularly about TIP. But, um, you know, there's other things, this complete streets thing, you know, we worked with the commission to get our phase one done, we did the prioritization plan, um, we went ahead and applied for the money and got the 500,000, but We've been sitting on that now, and, and I guess, you know, we're going to have this public forum. But when you begin to complicate it with issues like, you know, where to place these charging stations and stuff, um, you know, it may very well be that the commission could assist us in some oversight on the complete street stuff as we move forward on that, just to critique some of the things that we've done. Um, and then with with some of the things that have happened with district local technical assistance, there's a significant amount of money now that the commission can use to work with towns to apply for grants. Because there's that 175,000 that's in the, you know, um, DLTA, AA um, pot. And so if we could identify some projects that we thought made sense for us to try to go after some additional funding from outside sources, because obviously we don't always have it ourselves. Um, the commission has the wherewithal now with that money to help us um, in ways that they couldn't before. So those are the three topics that I thought made sense for us to sort of throw around. And I think probably it makes sense to start with the tip. Um, I mean, maybe you guys want to just sort of chat about the tip and the way in which it's, you know, items are placed on it and how projects score and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so what is the tip? Traffic. It's the transportation improvement It's basically a list of all the projects in the region expected to be constructed in the central mass. And uh, so the tip is sort of, it's money that we, the Central Mass region receives, so the Central Mass MPO uh, receives from federal and state matching. Yes. Uh, to use in the 40 communities in Central Mass. So I think we get, this year we get like close to $30 million. Right for, or is that the entire tip? No, that's uh, it for 26. It's between 26 and 32 million a year that the MPO gets to um, allocate to the, we call regional target funds, which all the community projects that come forward, they get to choose which ones get programmed in each of the five, it's a five year listing of projects. And, and the roads that are, it has to be a federally eligible road, obviously 62 is, and I'm sure, I'm sure there's others in Berlin that are. Hmm. Uh, this well, uh, Pleasant Street would be, because that, that connects <coughs> 290 and 62, right? Wouldn't that be considered? Uh, I don't think we have all that many. Yeah. Um, I might have some in the from sure. one of the stores that came through. Yeah. Any you might have been put in reimbursement. I mean, you guys have a sense as to which roads? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we have a map. I don't know if we have a map. I, I don't have it on me, but I can I can send it to you, Tim. Mm -hmm. So basically, a federally eligible road is any. Uh, road that's classified higher than a local road or a uh, uh, rural minor collector. Um, so Pleasant Street, I would assume, is one, just kind of- Yeah, it's a major secondary. Yeah. I mean, we, we've pushed as many as 40,000 cars with an incident of 45 miles. 
Yeah, so so kind of based on, on that, and I, I, I know Pleasant Street's on our list for a lot of our data collection activities, yeah. so I would I would very much guess that it is a federally eligible road, but uh, you know, mainly you know state number of routes, interstates, and then the roads that kind of connect between them uh, that aren't you know predominantly residential roads. And uh, uh, starting actually in the, the tip, so we do the tip for, for over a five-year period. So we're right currently in the 25 through 29 tip years. 25 is the ones we anticipate going out to uh, bid in well, February 25. Uh, but then we program for 26, 27, 28, 29. Then there's steps, obviously, to get, you know, we're hoping that in 26, all those go forward into 27. Doesn't always work out that way, we try. Uh, this year, starting in FY25, is the MPO has decided, and, and it was a concern that I've actually always had, living in a very rural town, but working in a much larger town, seeing that the rural towns struggle with the design side of paying for consultants to do the design. I mean, it could be half a million to a million dollars to design a TIP project, while a local town, small town, A, doesn't have the internal staff to do it, and probably doesn't have the, the uh, money available to be able to at, allocate a town meeting for the design process, which could be you do a design in say 25, it's not going to be constructed until starting in 29 or 30. Well, you're putting out a half a million or a million dollars now in hoping that it gets funded for FY30. Well, that's hard pill to swallow at town meeting. How do you go in front of town meetings and say this is what we need, but it may not get constructed for five years from now. So this year, starting in FY25, the MPO. Uh, is allowing up to a million dollars a year to be allocated for design funds. Obviously, be competitive just like the TIP project is, but at least now, as we get going, we're hoping it will be very competitive where some of the smaller towns will be able to get uh, TIP funded or at least get, get on the process where um, we can use the, the, the uh, allocated money so that you can actually go get a design completed so it gets you on that list. Because a lot of small towns have had that same problem. And then you have Berlin, and I'm from New Braintree, Hardwick, Old Camp. They have never had tip projects either because they can't afford it. The design stuff kills them. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, was to try to, how do we get where some of these towns that have never been to, through the tip process to be able to get tip projects on the board. Um, Kevin's been running the program now for, what, ever? Quite a while. And we're, I started with the commission in 99, and we had more, we had a plethora of projects been submitted for TIP projects. Now, we're, we struggle to keep, keep up. Uh, or not keep up, we struggle to get projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, it's full, but there's no competitive. Basically, you apply your rate, pretty much. Uh, and some of them we look at, it. No, we don't, we, we'll put them on, but uh, we would really like to see more, and I'll use the word equity, but equity across the, our 40 communities and where one community is not getting them all. And we've seen that you know, we're always getting, obviously Worcester's always going to have ones, at least they're submitting, but Worcester, uh, the areas in and around are always putting names in, but the, the rural towns are not. And that's always been a, you know, we've been trying, and I think about 10 years ago or so, we really started concentrating on, or, you know, as part of our evaluation when I used to be on the Transportation Advisory Committee was trying to get the rural towns to be included in this, because they never, they, you won't score well because you don't have the volumes that Worcester has. You don't have the volumes, you don't have this, the crash data that some of the, you know, the, the suburb much closer to Worcester towns do. So how do you how do you score well? Well, so that's another reason why a lot of the rural towns didn't do it. So the idea is now to try to help the rural town be able to get funded, get on the list, because a tip project, the design was always the town right away, in the and the design was the town's responsibility. But the construction is mass DOT. 
Well, you could put in a half a million or, th or three quarters of a million dollars into design, but you're getting a six or seven million dollar construction project done at their expense, not yours. Uh, which goes along and helps you in your payment management plan, it helps you on other things later, but basically you're getting a free road. But all you're responsible is for the design and right away. Right away is another issue that is an issue. But design has always been the, the roadblock to, to the small towns. So we're going to start making it. Worcester, we are doing Worcester this year as a pilot. Just to, this is FY29, they have a project ready. And we're going through the process, A, to kind of help us flush out any of the issues because we do are putting on a questionnaire. Um, when I, when Tim, I talked to Tim back, wait, probably in April. Yeah. Uh, so this would be a perfect opportunity for uh, a town like this. Let's see if, no, see if Berlin would be interested. Um, and we did the quarter study and this would be a perfect opportunity to do it. If, if you're so inclined, you know, that's up to you. It does require a 20% match from the town. But at least that's really, we want to make sure the town has skin in the game too. Mm -hmm. But it's better than 100%. Um, uh, we can assist in, in filling out the application. You do need a PRC number, which is the number you get from MassDOT that, that they say, yes, the project is eligible to move forward. But we want um, the application to us for the design prior to uh, you hiring consultant. And your consultant obviously has to be a Mass DOT uh, approved consultant. Um, and I won't tell you who to use because you use who you feel comfortable with. That's, that's your decision. Uh, but we will help at least to get you to try to get you some funding to move forward. You pick the location. If you think that 62 at the four, five corner, if, if that's the spot, you can, you can do that. Or you decide it's going to go someplace else. I mean, that's your decision where you want it. We're not going to, you know, you pick this, you know, no, I think you should do this. No, that, that's your decision because you know your town better than anybody. Um, I will warn you, uh, the time from design, start of design to construction is roughly five years at least. Just so, and, and that's why, which, which has been a deterrent to the question of small town. Because Shrewsbury or Worcester, they can handle, they can put out half a million, not a problem, and wait five years. That's not an issue. Berlin, small towns, no, that's not an that's not an easy pill to swallow. So we're here if you need help. So can you explain the MPO a little bit? That, you know, that you've got subregions that are represented on the on that committee. And okay. and Berlin's part of the northeast subregion. And I know there was recent so usually one of the select board members is is a representative of the subregion to the MPO. And then the MPO, along with other entities, is working on the evaluation of the projects, as I understand. But can you, just so these guys understand that jargon a little bit. Sure, so the MPO is uh, made up of a 10-member board. Um, MassDOT chairs, the secretary chairs the meeting, um, but also um, MassDOT Highway Division is a member. Uh, the WRT administrator, CMRPC is a member, um, and the six subregions in Central Mass, the city of Worcester and the five, we've split the remaining towns into five other subregions. So um, the two mass dot ones, WRT, CMRC, are always members, and so for the subregional uh, representatives, we basically do um, election meetings for uh, board, select board members to become representatives of the MPO. Um, it's for three-year terms. Um, there's usually one representative elected and also an alternate from another town, just in case that representative is unable to make a meeting or not. Um, as Tim mentioned, uh, the Northeast one was this uh, about a week or two ago. Um, Michelle Conlin from Shrewsbury is the new representative to the MPO for this subregion, while um, Bill Filsinger from Boylston is the alternate for this uh, subregion. Um, so basically, um, all the representatives have voting capacity at the meetings to approve endorsements of our documents, the TIP, UPWP, Long Range Transportation Plan, and also any 
other action items that the CMRPC staff, which is the staff to the MPO, um, brings forward for action or approval. Um, and also during the year, there are various amendments or adjustments to the current tip of moving projects back, moving forward, adjusting the costs. As you know, all costs always increase by the time they get uh, advertised. Um, so and they meet once a month, uh, third Wednesdays of the month. Um, and I don't believe a selectman from Berlin has ever participated. No. They've come to the lecture meetings. Um, I think someone expressed interest, but I don't think the person had the time. I don't remember the name right. of the person. Yeah. And our sub-region is North Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, Boston, Berlin, and Westbrook. Westbrook. Yeah. So we're a small sub-region to bit of some, and some are in 10 towns. Um, that means you've got a lot of clout if you're part of this sub-region in a sense because you're representing a small number of towns within a number of months. Yeah. And so for like the TIP for instance, staff will propose during the development of each, uh, each year when we develop a new TIP, staff will present options of programming the projects in which years <coughs> MPO members will vote to uh, approve uh, what staff recommended or make any changes at that moving at those meetings before the, the tip actually gets endorsed for that. And and you have had times where projects aren't ready and they get bumped. Do you, and sometimes you've asked somebody if they're ready a year early, I guess, because you've got a slot and you've got some money. Um, is is that happening? Uh, more often now as a result of there being less competition or still things are flowing pretty evenly? Not so much of projects moving up we don't find to see much anymore. I mean, it's really there are projects that move back because they're just falling. They need to be like at a certain point by the time they get to like the first or second year of the tip and um, every February um, staff meets with MassDOT Office of Transportation Planning. We go over the whole project universe, what's programmed, and get <coughs> like a, an update and status of where they are in which year their uh, potential programming would be, whether they can move up, whether they, will they have to be pushed back of the current tip for the development of the new tip. Um, so staff has a good idea around there which projects will be falling back and how, how we can, if there's any projects that are capable of moving up um, that's good. Uh, if not, then there might be more funding gaps in those years. There, like, there's a couple of years in this tip that's, you know, there's maybe nine, ten million dollars left of unspent funds because we just don't either have a project to fill those or um, projects to move up to uh, spend that money. Mm -hmm. But we all know that by the time projects move up for the first year, uh, the cost will go up, so they will eat some of the money available. Um, in those years. So the Corridor study when Sujatha and Rich and did you come to that meeting when we did? I did. We, you did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we we looked at that. I mean, we said the center of town with complete streets will probably take care of itself. The 62 Gates Pond Road. Um, the state has looked at that and said, no, it doesn't meet the, you know, the warrant. It, you're never going to find a, an opportunity to throw another signal in there. It's too close to the ramps and that sort of stuff. So it didn't seem as though that was as high a priority for us to try to deal with immediately. Well, it's a problem, but it didn't seem as though it was solvable in the same way some others might be. And then the culvert issues along 62, we felt, could be dealt with independently with some, you know, outreach for some grant money now and then and trying to pick up pieces here and there. But the five corners rose to the top as the most logical piece. But, I mean, it's got a lot of complicated moving pieces with the railroad tracks <laughs> and, and, and availability of land and all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, I think we've talked about it. We, do we? Do we still think it's something that we want to pursue, or you know, is there something else that's more logical? And you know, do you guys have observations based on what you've seen? Uh, I will say that one of the, one of the objectives of Mass DOT is any tip project sort of be designed as is, as if it's a complete street, also. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. 
So it really ends up being a complete streets project, though it's not under that funding, it's under mm -hmm. a different pot of money, but the design will be a complete street. You'll probably yep. have sidewalks, you'll probably have you know, uh, shared use paths, or you'll have whatever, depending on speed and things, but you'll have, it'll be designed as if it is one. Um, the ultimate design of that one, I and mean, the uh, tracks and then the culvert underneath it, and not sure that's a difficult one. Uh, but, I mean, again, to me, it's you, what you think is the, your highest priority. And it could be for various reasons. It could be whether it's a, a, crash, cl a crash cluster location. It could be because it's a narrow road that you want to widen. It's an area that you want to add sidewalks and bike lanes, et cetera. All those things, as long as it's on a federally eligible road, could be considered. Uh, look at, uh, and, and I'll put my old DPW hat on, look at roads that you can will probably won't be able to get to because of the cost, because your Chapter 90 money won't come anywhere close to doing it, but it's your road. So how do you pay for it? I mean, 62, I'm assuming it's a town road, well, town maintained. T town maintained, so it's an old county layout. Yeah. Well, for you to do 62, what is that, five years worth of Chapter 90 money if you do the entire length? Mm -hmm. You're not going to do it. You've got other priorities. So is the 62 would be prime location to, but you have to add the sidewalks in. Do you have the right-of-way? Now you've got right-of-way issues. Do you have the width? Those types of things. But you should consider those. But if all you're responsible for is the design and the uh, right away, you're getting a project that you will never be able to do under Chapter 90. Is your crash incidence at that five corners as significant as it is in other places? No, Marlboro and Jason is busier. Yeah. I mean, you, you add more on Randall in 62 probably than you do. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, what, what's your sense? Is it something that we just live with and we worry about some other place, or, you know, is it something that you... Well, I'm not aware of any of the significant issues that are going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many accidents we have. Uh, at, um, at times, it depends on the season, how traffic comes up. Right. Uh, I said, yeah, oh, because I can eat that. I mean, there were times, I can recall, when I was going to Clinton all the time, that if it was, you know, quarter of eight in the morning, the number of cars that were backed up sometimes were all the way to Randall. Oh, yeah. And, and I haven't been doing that for a couple of years, so, I mean, I'm assuming it's still a problem. Oh, yeah, definitely traffic from Clinton's problem. I mean, there's, there's more on that leg, you know, old West, West Street, than there is on the coming down on the new 62 on Boylston, right? And that's what people cutting up over the Lincoln to get on the Boylston. Yeah. So they don't have to sit on Western. They'll sit on Boylston because people, you can just blow the stops on and not have an issue. You can um, get it, yeah. The people coming off of West Street, they're actually waiting to find out if the car coming at you is going to turn right or go straight. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're coming down off Boylston Road, they are just coast right through it and just keep going. So I've seen a lot of people do the cutoff. And then you look and you're like 15 cars deep into it and there goes that car. Yeah. So yeah, people are using that as a cut. So yeah. level of service is crap for some of the times in the morning. Oh, no doubt. No. Yeah. First thing for you. Yeah, I'm not sure the crashes are going to be bad. I mean, it's just one because I think if we did it on crashes, we don't, it's like, because that intersection on the other one scares me as gates at 62. We don't have any other crashes at all. We're going to start going to 62 and we don't hear any of those intersections. But I think that traffic on that side of the inversion is going to have a way that the crashes don't occur. I mean, the corridor study identified and it said it's something to pay attention to when it might very well fare well on the, on the tip. But do, how, how do you, how do we get a preliminary assessment as to whether or not the, the problems that are there are surmountable in such a way that it would be reasonable to even go forward? I mean, is there, is there a preliminary step that we can take before you even get too far involved? I mean, the best, maybe just even talk to MassDOT 
District 3 just to see to get their thoughts on the intersection and say, hey, you know, this is what your concerns are. Um, this is, you know, we're thinking of maybe you know, going forward with a TIP project. You know, do you have any thoughts of is this going to be good? Because after to, MathDOT has to approve this project before it's even going to be eligible for the TIP to begin with. So um, they have to be on board with what you're planning to do before it gets approved. So it's probably good to talk to them prior to even filling out, starting the filling out of the, the project need form and mm -hmm. the, the project information. So, um, and you'll have a better sense, I think, if it's worthwhile, if, if it's even doable because of the, the geometry, the train tracks, the culvert and stuff like that. And you know, they, maybe they even would have an estimate of how much something like that intersection would cost to you know, is it, would it be a roundabout? Would it be a traffic signal? Um, you know, there's five legs into that intersection. You know, there might, you know, it might have to somehow reduce it to four to make it function if it's just a signalized intersection. So um, that might be the first step to try with them to uh, see what they think. And I, I think if there's also a specific location you want to talk to MassDOT about, if you let us know ahead of time, we could probably pull all the data that we have available kind of in that area and send it to you, you know, just so that you can you can go with them with, you know, what we have available and, and at least have a little bit more background information kind of going into that meeting. You know, traffic counts, you know, we can pull the crash data from the impact portal, um, stuff like that. Yeah, we can also, if I can, can also assist being like the intermediary between DOT and the town. So we're in their building, right. so we have a little bit of, uh, we need them, we can go upstairs and talk to them upstairs, which is a huge advantage. I think that we're uh, unique amongst any of the other uh, RPAs, regional planning organizations. We actually, our office is in DOT's building, at least the transportation section is, which actually is uh, very, you run into them in the hallway, uh, so it, it does help us, um, but we can help also be kind of like that you know, conduit between you and Mass DOT. Yeah. The, the commission's doubled in size in the last four years in terms of staff, so we're up over 60 full-time equivalents now, and we're reaching out with a lot of new ventures that we hadn't pursued before. But as a result, because DOT had underutilized their new building on North Plantation Street there, they they reached out at the same time we were wondering about where we would expand to and, and they said you know we got room because they don't have room now like they had but they they volunteered it and we we jumped in and that's what jeff's talking about so it means there's a relationship there that's sort of unique within the rpas which gives us a leg up in some ways that's pretty nice um, so anyway, that's some got stuff for you. I mean, I, I'm just yeah, I know. I mean, I'm board. You guys like, can throw like, these ideas around amongst yourselves. Like what I think of, I think of a from Pleasant Street up to 495. You know, we've got a lot of wear and tear uh, with incidents on the highway, mm -hmm. even the construction that they did out in 290. They, you know, probably what, like 5,000, 7,000 cars a day for a year extra. That we had when the construction was going on, yeah. you know, that's why I think I'd be more apt to put money into that area. You know, and, and and that helps you with your Sawyer Hill interchange yeah. with those issues and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, it's stuff you. I mean, I just felt you know if you guys had a chance to chat with these guys and understood what the process was, you know, it could, there's yeah. there's opportunity for some planning, mm -hmm. you know, some engineering and and. Uh, if that's a new part of the program, so in small towns like us, might very well be set up for yeah. pursue that. So. And just thinking about 62, I, I know that Mass UT kind of has like a like a secret program, someone I'll call it. Like, <laughs> well, like, uh, so they, they have a program <laughs> where they are. Uh, Shut off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's be because state numbered routes that they don't own, they get a lot of complaints about. So they had a program they launched a couple years ago where they were paying to repave municipally owned state numbered routes um, and it's supposed to be and it's kind of decided which routes will be done at the 
Boston office level, kind of the headquarters, and then they kind of kick it down and talking with the districts, it sounds like sometimes they find out after those decisions have been made. Uh -huh. uh, but if 62 is kind of such a big problem, it might be worth, uh, I can send you the, 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 the correct name of the program. It's uh, actually the uh, Massachusetts Municipal Theater. Yeah. Is, I looked into it, um, and it's actually, they're the ones that decide whether or not the road is ready for it. Okay, correct. Yeah, so correct. maybe if we can drive a couple okay. extra trucks down <laughs> at 62, yeah. we yeah. can uh, get, a, get a free paving out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know it was expensive. We did, uh, we did one project that I think started right around Colburn Road and went towards five quarters. And then when uh, they had the bicentennial, we did just the opposite way and came to the center of town uh, before that program existed. Okay. Um, and that was a uh, full path reclamation. Yeah. So yeah, when I saw that program was available, I looked into it and realized that they're the ones that say, yeah, this road's ready. Right. It's got nothing to do with it. Yeah, which is kind of the unfortunate part of that one. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, Lancaster ended up doing that. I think it was a Route 110. They did a super pave out there, or a micro pave. And uh, it was like, how, how, how can you guys do this much? They did two different streets, and they told me what. And I was like, look anyway. Yeah. But yeah, you kind of get shot to it. Yeah. Hmm. And it's also important to consider no matter you know, which roadways or intersections that you choose to pursue for improvements that you know, staff uses uh, some project evaluation criteria to rank and rate all the projects that come through the MPO. Um, and it's based on numerous areas such as, you know, safety, uh, state of good repair, which is, you know, pavement and bridge condition, uh, congestion related criteria, uh, multimodal, you know, sidewalks, ADA ramps, bicycle facilities. Uh, there's no transit out here, so that wouldn't affect you as much. Um, you know, stormwater, uh, travel and tourism criteria, economic trucking, um, security. Um, so we don't want to see projects that, you know, are just doing one thing. You're not going to find um, just paving projects anymore. You know, you're going to need to incorporate, as Jeff said, you know, the complete streets approach, you know, bicycle, pedestrian. You know, consider all modes when you're doing um, these projects and you want to kind of more of the high priority roads that have all these problems that you know about crashes, congestion, um, and not just one, the road that might be a good project, but it's only fixing, say, the, the, the pavement or the sidewalks as opposed to, okay, there's not really many crashes on this road. So that's another thing to think about when you're thinking of um, which roads or intersections that you want to pursue. One consideration is also drainage improvements. So if you have an area, say on 62, it also has drainage concerns, culvert crossings, or even just on-road drainage problems. They will be addressed as part of this project. So the corridor study identified culvert issues mostly west of the center on 62. And what were there, half a dozen? Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, but there were, there were the, I guess the half a dozen were the, were the most critical or whatever. Yeah, there, there was, I think, three of them that were in critical, yeah. according to our assessments. So, do we pursue that through, an, through another avenue, or? I mean, there are other alternatives with culvert crossings. Is DO, is D, E, D, D, E, R grants very competitive, and you have to show a real need. Uh, we've been successful in getting a couple of those. And they have others we have not. Yeah, if you can combine more projects on that screen. Correct. So you know, if you decide to do it as a TIP project, you would address it at the same time. It'd be part of that same process. Uh, and that'd be all part when you finally go submit it, the design cost or the construction cost would include the upgrades to those culverts as part of the project. And therefore, you're also addressing culverts, stormwater, because uh, I'm assuming they're undersized, they probably don't meet current standards. Um, so, you know, we've currently got a $100,000 year mark to look at rail trail issues on the, the leg from Highland Street east to the Hudson part of the rail trail, Central Mass Rail Trail. Um, and that's an easier piece to deal with because MBTA controls it. From from and, and it goes to, actually it goes to code, 
But from Coburn on, you've got other entities that control that. And, you know, so, so people have scratched their head and said, you know, how do we put these pieces together? The Five Corners continues to be a, a problem and going to try to deal with rail trail issues there. Um, so maybe what we're, you know, maybe what we want to throw into the mix is this COVID issue on that leg. Um, just the, the, the capacity of the highway, you know, I mean, is it something that we ought to be thinking about expanding in such a way that you can throw the rail trail from Coburn to the five corners and get it through the five corners as part of that mix? Because what's that, three quarters of a mile? Yeah. And that, that helps us sort of pile on more issues onto the same project. It doesn't deal with your 62 East Pleasant Street section, but it deals with the culvert issues and the rail trail issue. Yeah, so if you're looking at TIP projects, also considering it almost will be a complete streets, so therefore I wouldn't look at it to do a TIP project on an area you don't want sidewalks just because of the location. Right. If it's an area that you, uh, it doesn't make sense to have a sidewalk at that location, don't go for a TIP project there. Do it, do that, either through something else, do it yourself. But if it's an area that you definitely want walkability, on uh, biking, et cetera, then yeah, TIP project is ideal. You know, when we did the complete streets prioritization plan, it was the center, which we've got this 500,000 for, but then the, the, the additional legs ended up being down Pleasant Street to try to get to Northbrook Village and you know, eventually the post office and River Bridge and that whole complex down there. So from a sidewalk point of view and a complete streets point of view, um, and the fact that Pleasant Street has issues in terms of capacity dealing with all the extra flow that comes across our way if there's problems at 495 and 290. Um, and and you, we're saying that Pleasant Street's eligible probably for it. Yeah, we'll, we'll verify, uh, Rob will verify, he's got the map. Yep, I've got to bring my I am with now. Let me see. Anyway. Yeah, because Route 62, as far as bike lane and sidewalks, and we're looking at major, major infrastructure. Yeah. Well, because right away, it's just not so Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, you are, you know, that's... It's, it's being basically built on a hill, so like, right. one side drops off, and right. actually, you know, on the west side, oh, both sides drop off. You know, so yeah. you know, like, that's going to be Maybe. serious yeah. encroachment yeah. by the people's properties. Right. Yeah, and and uh, that speed is, what, 45 through there? So you'll end up with a sidewalk on one side, five foot bike lane, 11 foot travel lanes, five foot bike lane, grass strip, and an eight foot uh, uh, shared use path on the other side. So you're talking yeah, right. 65 feet, something like that. Yeah. If you're right away 60, <laughs> but the actual really pavement with the guardrails is only say 40, your road footprint is another 20 feet beyond that. So I was always, I looked at 140 north from Shrewsbury Center to Boylston, that was my problem. I was gonna be putting the shared use path literally 10 feet from people's front doors. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna work. I'll never get that, I'll never get that passed by the town. There's no way. So, but also can't, can't, wouldn't have been able to afford it to pave it, so we're stuck. The town was stuck with what to do with it. Can't do tip because don't have a right away. So those are things you should consider as as you move forward. Is it, what makes sense now? If it's a thirty, I think it's under forty. You can go sidewalk, sidewalk, with right adjacent to the uh, to the road. So it's much narrower. You don't have this uh, shared use path, nor do you have the five foot strip between the shared use path and. Do we have to do a sidewalk on each side? Is that more than likely? Yes. At least that's what they've done in the past. Now, also depending on how rural the, ta the, the road is. If the road is really rural, no. But if it's an area where people will be walking, they will, Mass DOT will require sidewalks as part of your, because of your complete streets. Yeah. You also have to look at your complete streets policy. 
Yeah, a similar thing as uh, 117, where as you turn off from uh, Main Street in Lancaster. <coughs> Same thing there. They went from just this, the roadway to what you just described, the five foot sidewalk, the vault of use on the other side. Uh, and it, it's huge. Yeah, the only good part though is that they didn't really take from anybody because the road was already wide enough. Yeah. Well, the area it was too was wide, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, up through five corners, I've never seen people walking. Some no. boys pass through over time. Yeah. You never see people walking except for one gentleman that goes to the Olympic store down to them. That's your own. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you, you would see foot traffic on Pleasant, and that's why the prioritization yeah. plan identified it. I mean, you, you've, you've got between Northbrook Village and the residential units that are there, the access to the school, which we never utilized. I mean, we've, we've got a right away from Pleasant into the school area that the town controls, but it's never developed. Um, but, you know, and that's something in the long term that probably makes sense to yeah. evaluate just so you've got two ways into the school. Yeah. Um, but, and that's why we put Pleasant Street high on that list. Because we could get to the school with sidewalks, but to continue on South Street got more complex because of bridges and, you know, all. we just said Pleasant Street makes so much more sense. Do we have a width on Pleasant Street? Well, that's the issue. I mean, well, I think, I think we'd have the width from one sidewalk on one side of the street, yeah. but not, not two sidewalks. Yeah, 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 uh, is, is the right, you know if the right away is 50 feet? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. If it's 50, you probably do. If it's an old right away, no, probably no. not. But then you would have to do right away takings. Which is an honor, which is an onerous process. It's doable. Well, I'll be honest, I haven't been on Pleasant Street in a long time, so I don't, I'll go home that way and take a look. But um, I'd be surprised if it's 50. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I, I would doubt if it's at least 50. You think it is 50 the right of way? Yeah. But no, even by the keys, I mean, like that house is sitting right in front, the stone wall right in front of it. You think, yeah. yeah. Huh? Well, even right up there on Woodward Ave, if you look at the paper, it's. It starts out at uh, like 40, and it gets just before Fran's house, yeah. and it's 50. Really? And then it's choked down again from the intersection with uh, Carter. Mm. Mm. Well, we do have it on that. Um, That's good. I actually saved it. It's the sheet that uh, it's right on Mastod's page. Yeah. Right. Mm. So it's on our desktop. So my suggestion is <coughs> you all think about what you what makes sense for, for you, and we can, I said, we can help assist with mass DOT but really if that's your decision on where, which direction you want what makes the most sense for the town of Berlin not uh, I, I we, we're not gonna come and say yeah you should definitely do this intersection because that you know your town better than anybody uh, and I think it's you know, and also think about your long-range plans of wh what you know, where you want you know, if, you, if you think there's gonna be more people walking on plus you, you know that should be a high consideration of the reasons why you know, access to school, access to other, other, you know, commercial and residential. You know, that, that makes the most sense. That is where I see the majority of pedestrians right now is, well, with the exception of the general store in the center there, but it's on Pleasant Street. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we've tried to figure out strategies to get people out of Northbrook Village so they could walk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've talked about connecting to the town land because there is that avenue there to cross through the school property, but, you know, we haven't developed that. Yeah. Um, and and we know there's, we, you know, you see them, they're leaving the site, trying to figure out directions yeah. to go, but they could access, you know, conservation land as they proceed yeah. down and get onto trails and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you've got the, the piece, you know, at, at Brewer Brook, you've got the piece at Bobby Acres, you know, and stuff, so. Yeah, we, I mean, we also have to provide you with a map that we've used in our long-range transportation plan that shows we do like an integration analysis of all the roadways, the federal aid roadways, that includes like all the data we collect and kind of compile it into like one to see, you know, which roadways have the high volumes, have the high crashes, has the high congestion, has the high trucks, um, to give you the idea of which roads are having more of these type of pro potential problems or categories that you're looking for, you know, sidewalks, ADA ramps, mm -hmm. um, other stuff. So it might help you to choose a, a location. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, just another tool that might be useful to the town that you guys could use. 
Good. And Rob can send that when he sends the uh, the Fed aid now. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put together as much stuff as I can and, and send it over uh, to I think I the group's email. I'll send it, uh, you know, probably tomorrow uh, as soon as, as early as I can. Okay. Thank you. That enough? Bridges and culverts. I mean, there's there's opportunity out there. It's <coughs> If most of it is associated with 62 west of the center, yeah. or you get you mean get stuff scattered all over hell, but oh yeah, yeah. Um, is there a list of uh, like I know chapter 90 has a list that like what you can use chapter 90 for them. Is there a list that kind of pretty much tells you what you can and can't do as a tip project? So the tip project is really for the re reconstruction of existing roads. But you will have to do improvements like the drainage improvements. What it will not cover is water and sewer. If you if there's no water and sewer, uh, you would have to do that on your own. Uh, they're not going to do electric. Obviously, that it was in National Grid here. The so National Grid. If you have to do any pole relocation, that's on. They'll be partially funded, but those will all have to be reload done by National Grid. Uh, basically, the tip is really for the uh, improvements of the public ways to bring it up for multimodal transportation. Mm -hmm. But it does include drainage and stormwater. So any stormwater drainage improvements are covered under the tip. Okay. As part of a bigger plan. Oh, right. Uh, I, along, believe, yeah. I believe it's called, I know, I haven't seen the necessities being forward, but I know MassDOT has projects that are just improving culverts. They might do some road work around the area they're doing the culvert work, though. But I know, I believe culvert projects are eligible under the tip if you just want to say fix those two, three culverts, whatever. That might be just something as another project to do and, and not worry about the roadways or the intersection at that time or something. Huh. So that way it wouldn't be treated as like the complete screen. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Huh. Like was on Princeton when they recently Yeah, because I mean that that was clearly the one of the issues as the corridor study pointed out. Um, between the center and the five corners in particular was those culverts. Right, so you know, let's let's say you decide that you're gonna repave sixty two using chapter ninety. Or town, other town funds, but the culverts you might be able to do under a separate grant, and we've got we, we're doing that in a couple other towns, helping them secure grants for culvert replacement, both design side and construction. So we can help if need. You know, let us know. We can help try to uh, you know, secure grants. There are rounds that come out. I can't remember when they normally come out. Probably. A lot. And the, probably the grants for culverts, you'll probably get those quicker than the, the tip project being built. So, mm -hmm. I mean, grants, you have to yes. use, use, use the money within a year, yeah, as opposed to waiting five years for the culverts to be fixed. Now, culvert funds, um, independent of bridge funds, bridge, bridges are far more complex and more yes. competitive than culvert yeah. work. Yeah, so culverts you can do multiple different ways. There's DER grants, there's MVP grants. There's other uh, methods to get culverts because the culverts is one of the hot, big, big ticket items lately. You know, that's the new buzzword is culvert replacement because <coughs> of the uh, hazard mitigation plans that were done. I'm assuming it's well, the quarter study shows ahead of time. If you had a hazard mitigation plan, that would also show it that that those are you know, issues, especially with the climate resiliency. That that is a key item that they're trying to address culvert. And obviously now you see the pictures from Tennessee, et cetera. Now I think that's extreme uh, there as well. Uh, but I mean, it's still in the forefront of trying to get a lot of these undersized culverts re uh, replaced, brought up to current standards. Um, a lot of them are probably old corrugated metal. Well, we, we did, I don't, know, I don't know if Zach Blaze from our staff talked to you, we did this year looked at your federal aid culverts on all your roadways that are federal aid eligible, mm -hmm. uh, not just 62. So um, I know at some point, I think there was one or two culverts, I think on South Street, because the bridge is closed that we weren't able to get to yet. So I think we were kind of waiting before we give you a report for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that that'll be coming at some point um, for you guys to look at and consider. For the I actually town. did look into uh, the DER grant. Uh, had to uh, sit down uh, to see if it was eligible for a project. Um, was it's a triple pipe corrugated pipe on the end of Randall Road at West Street, um, but there was just so much for the DER grant. Uh, even our town administrator submitted one one time, and she forgot like one little minute thing, and they kicked it out. And it was like, oh my god. Um, yeah, so we can help you uh, with that applying for that type of room. We just got one for Warren. Uh, that's where you're taking a double culvert and replacing with one. We get the design funds for that. Yeah, yeah uh, I think the gentleman that sat in was uh, is it Zach. Zach. Is Zach. Yep. Blaze. 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 Yeah. 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 So he actually sat in on the call. Yeah. Okay. Call that we did on that one. Um, yeah, he's been he's been successful in getting those grants. They are they're highly competitive. Oh, very much. You know, <laughs> and that too is matching as well, right? Uh, that one is no. That is a reimbursement. On the design side, it's a, it's a reimbursement. So you have to have the funds and then they reimburse you at the end. And then MVP, I mean, we're MVP community. Yeah, we, we've actually received more, but um, I've never looked into it, so I couldn't tell you what they were about. Did we just, get, we just got an MVP grant for something, did we? Uh, conservation. Yeah, yeah, conservation, yeah. So it is. Yeah, yeah, for Horseshoe Pond. So oh, yeah. So yeah. apparently that throws us out for a few more years. Yeah. Oh, so we should have an answer for that next week at the next uh, yeah. hazard mitigation yeah, meeting. Yeah, we need to believe that's what we're going to use for next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that was brought up in the last one. I thought they got a shared street to our neighbors here when we did that one way temporary right. see how it worked out deal. <coughs> so we've had that one. Yeah. Anything else? No, oh, it was definitely very important. Is it any, any further questions, feel free to give our office a call. Yeah, I mean, it's, we got to think of something quick because five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? What? Well, yeah, so, so what's, what's the next? Next since today could be awful in three years from now. Oh, well, that's so, correct. That's correct. That's why, you know, we should really, look, really focus on, you know, at least the section. Yeah, we'd be setting this up for the next guy to handle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I'll never, I won't see it, so it so doesn't mean we can't work for it towards it. Exactly. Yeah, set them up in good hands. Yeah. 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 Let's, you know, don't want to don't uh, hand them over a hot pile of you know what. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what they call them succession plans, right? Yep. Thanks. All right. Sure. Thank awesome. you, gentlemen. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other business that I anticipated by the chair? I, I, this. These charging stations. The the right of way is wide enough so what they're proposing is on the grass but on 100 percent because we went up and we marked it we sprayed the ground the week i, I was conversing with the, the woman Connie, yeah um yeah so we went up the next morning and marked it and there really isn't much grass you discovered some interesting facets of you know installing charging stations when you were in Shrewsbury. Yes. Do you want to share that with these guys before you leave? Because I sure I think at the I, meeting I, it or, or or we could adjourn and take them up there and show them what they want. Well, well, I'll give you a little bit of so it one, was really helpful. So one concern with the installate installation of charging stations, especially on retrofits on existing parking lots and parking spaces. Currently, there is no standards for ADA accessibility to charging stations, both federal or state. Nobody knows yet what the requirement will be for especially federal uh, ADA requirements. They, if you put in a charging station, so you, you, the concern is 
what will come out once ADA, both federal and the state or state AAB and state AD or federal ADA comes out with standards? What is that standard going to be? So it's been assumed that A, if you put a charging station in, at least one of them has to be handicapped accessible. Handicapped accessible based upon federal, what I've seen in federal, the space has to be, uh, I'm trying, uh, it's been a while, but I think it's 20 feet deep by 13 feet wide. Because a person has to be able to go around the, the, the entire building, the entire car with the uh, charging. And the problem is, is the chargers on uh, car, the ports on the cars are random. They're in different locations. So it has to be able to be available for somebody to be able to take it and go all the way around in a wheelchair. So one has to, should be at least one. The question always is, is if you have, let's say you have a parking lot, and it's 10, so you need one handicapped space, and you decide to put two charges in, are you, is the handicapped space also count as your handicapped EV space, or do you have to have a second? No one knows yet. They don't know when they're going to come up with the standard either. There has to be an accessible route from that charger to a public way. So if you put them on street, you have to have the aisle. Then how do you get them from there to a sidewalk? There's no sidewalk. Yeah. Then you can't direct them out into traffic if you follow ADA standards. It has to go to a landing. So the complete streets first proposal throws the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street from where the EV stations are being proposed. And when I listen to people lately, they talk about the sidewalk network around the common. There's some value in considering the three sides of the common itself. And there's two sides now that have sidewalks that are, I guess, reasonably ADA compliant. But the third leg is naked, there's nothing on it. And the, the proposal from Complete Streets is to throw the third leg on the opposite side of the street where there's four driveways. Yeah. And the reason for that is they want to connect what's coming up from like the W. Morgan side. Yeah. And contain that all the way up to Carterville. Yeah. Um, but I think when the forum happens, the public feedback may very well be why aren't we considering the third leg on the common itself? And parking still stays on that side because to put the parking on the opposite side would interfere with everybody's driveway, so you're obviously going to lose a lot of parking spaces. So, well, you know, so, um, I've even had people comment they want to know the 19 cars. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's good that they're coming out the No, I think there's going to be a lot of ideas thrown around. But because of that, the, the EV station, um, depending on where the sidewalk goes and then to try to deal with the issues you're talking about in terms of long-term compliance, you know, how do you get from that spot to, to, the, to the sidewalk? Do you, have, you know? You, so, so technically you would, if, if there is no sidewalk, you would have to have, it, let, let's say you decide to put your handicapped parking on that side, you would have to have a crosswalk that went from the, the uh, aisle that you have between the handicapped spaces to an, an accessible space that have to be a crosswalk mm -hmm. at that location, which also have to meet ADA standards. So your parking space would have to have the same thing on an ADA space, it can't be any more than 2% cross slope in any one direction. So if it was on a little bit of an incline, that would not be compliant. Um, there is, there is a, uh there is a dip the there, right? Ups, yeah, yeah, one of the pro so in sh when I was in Shrewsbury, we put in chargers at several of the parks in two of our high the high school and, and one of our middle schools, and we had an audit done, and all of them were non-compliant under federal ADA. 
even though there's no standard, they came right out and said that they're all non-compliant. How soon do you think a standard's going to get? That's so. I, so I, I, when I was still in Shrewsbury, I kept asking Mass A B when they were even. They, they said it's not even on the horizon to look at. I said, yeah, but you're requiring all these these charging stations, but you have no standards. Yeah. So at what point, if you know, every parking lot, I'm assuming, I don't know what the Fort Merlin's uh, parking standard was, it nine by 18 parking spaces, more than likely? I'm not sure we even have a standard. But most are nine by 18. Yeah. That's standard in Massachusetts, and that mostly, well, if federal says that, ADA says they need to be 20 feet deep, well, you, all your parking lots now are in trouble. They're not gonna, they don't, you, how do you retrofit if you need 20 foot spaces? When you only have 18, you're going to take into the aisle? No, that's, you, that, you still need the 24 foot aisles. So the, the, the retrofits are going to be the problem. If you, could, if you were designing something brand new today, parking lot, you could design it correctly. Well, assuming we have standards. Because there still is no standard yet to know that if you have a new go with that 25% of your parking spaces in commercial has to be EV ready. I think that's what this new building code or new uh, code is going to be going to say. But how many of those have to be uh, handicapped accessible? No, no one knows. No. But 25 have to be. I think it's 25 percent. I can't remember. Talk to your building inspector. That's a huge number. Correct. But it's anticipating where we're headed. Well, so now I don't want to get into it, but. <laughs> My question then becomes, if 25 have to be EV, 25% be EV, let's say you are required to have 100 parking spaces, but that's what, because that's what the zoning requires. But only 5% of people use the EV, do I need more parking spaces then? Yeah. Because they're not using, and our people are going to be allowed to park in the EV spaces. Yeah. So, uh, so our answer to them is, we have no issue where I put them, just make sure they're ADA compliant. Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll find the, the information on the current status or at least the current standard that everybody's envisioning. That'd be helpful because that's any, anything we do ought to be. But well, this is why I've always said we're putting the, you know, this whole EV thing, we're putting the car before the horse. It, it's, you know, I mean, look at Florida once again lost houses over EVs, you know, in salt water. You Correct. Know? You know, I'm waiting for the, the, you know, every few years when Boston gets flooded with, with the ocean, like, imagine the EVs driving through city streets, you know, like. But well, they said the, one of the problems also is it's not only just uh, saltwater intrusion, so just water coming up, but the yeah. sea spray. Sea spray, yeah. Because once this uh, lithium ion batteries in saltwater do not mix. Mm -hmm. So the sea spray was getting, because even cars that were inland yeah. are, are they're just spontaneously combusting because they're corroding and they, they can't put them out. Bikes, electric bikes. <laughs> you can't do electric bikes either. <laughs> what I like is that guy that goes by on the one wheel. Oh, you see him come up on the road. Jesus, this guy goes by on one wheel on Flood Street every day. Is it a unicycle or is he just up like this? He's, no, he, he just stands on it. He stands on it. He's got flashing lights on his back. He's got a helmet. He's got a But he's going, what's he going? 25? I was going to say 25. Yeah, it's a quick load of units. And the wheel's this big, right? And then it's got the boards that he stands on. Man, is he hollow. Just, yeah, yeah. And I, I watch him. I think, I want to stop this guy and talk to him and just say, <laughs> what are you, are you, are you happy about this? Are you secure? Oh man, it's gotta be cold in the morning. I, I had a person in an EV bike. I was on Belmont Street in Worcester yesterday in Ford, and the guy passed me on an EV bike. Wow. Going up the hill. <laughs> he was he was and he was zigzagging into the traffic, and it was an EV bike. He was flying. Yeah. All right. Motion, I'm happy. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 19.